Let me say good evening. Welcome well, to Bear Pod Books. <laughs> um, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. I'd like yeah. to invite you, if you're in the back and you'd like to sit in the front, please feel free to do so. I'm very excited to present Kathleen Carr, author of Miraculum Monstrum, a unique narrative tale that blends poetry, prose, what I kind of think is science fiction-y and fantasy, and original artwork. Um, I, for one, am in awe of this work, the layers of fable upon fable, and how the tale unfolds through poetry and cataloged fictional documents. It just astounds me. And I love the idea of the Museum of Ladder Hybrids and the Post-Climate Disaster Collection. Just that idea alone, I, I was so enthralled with that kind of idea. It's, it's so creative and unique. Um, this book is truly a brilliant contribution to contemporary dystopic literature. To quote the author Jan Kahn, who has a, a blurb on the back, if you haven't read Miraculum Monstrum yet, I urge you to pick up your copy tonight. We have them at the front desk, um, and then you can have it signed by Kathleen tonight. She joins us from North Adams, Massachusetts. Tonight's talk and reading will be about an hour, including time for Q&A, and I'd like to remind you to please mute or turn off your cell phones. And to let you know, I was mentioning the front door is now locked, so if you need to leave during the reading, please use the back door, which is that way. Um, the front door will um, open again after the reading. If you need a bathroom, it's located at the back of the store, to the right of the back door. And please help yourself to refreshments. We have cookies and juice and seltzer. I'd like to thank the Vermont Arts Council for featuring tonight's event as a Vermont Arts 2018 program and you can help yourself to a Vermont Arts Council sticker. They're at the refreshment table. I'd also like to thank Orca Media. They're here filming the um, event tonight. And if you'd like to see this video or learn about other events, I'm going to pass around our newsletter sign-up sheet. you to sign up. Um, we'll have the video in the next newsletter. Um, let me tell you about a few events coming up for National Poetry Month in April. <coughs> we have a terrific lineup. We have our annual open poetry reading, which is next week, Tuesday, at 7 p.m. You can sign up at the door and read your original work for about three to five minutes. We also have Allison Prine, who was a Vermont uh, Book Award finalist last year with her book, Steel. She'll be reading with Bianca Stone, who's the author of this newly published the Mobius Strip Club of Grief. They'll both be here on Tuesday, April 17th. And you can find all of that information in the Poem City program. You can pick one up at the counter or find them around town. Um, we're also featuring an author. She's a poet, but this is her first collection of short stories, Elena Georgiou. And this is The Immigrant's Refrigerator. She'll be here April 24th. And she'll be speaking, she'll be reading from her book and speaking with a member of the Vermont Refugee Resettlement Program. Mm -hmm. And um, sales from the book go to, um, as donations to the Vermont Refugee Resettlement Program. So that'll be a, a really fascinating talk. So for now, let's welcome the winner of the 2015 Clarissa Dalloway Book Prize from Arojo Foundation and the Best Book Award finalist in the fiction cross genre category. She's a writer and visual artist. Please help me welcome Kathleen Carr. Thank you, Thank you Samantha. I'm um, so happy to be here and I feel so very welcomed by this bookstore and everybody here. Thank you for coming out. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Because there is a mic. And, uh, Sometimes, sometimes people can't hear me, so let me know. Um, so I think Sam did a pretty good job of describing what, what the book is essentially what's happening. So I might just start reading and interject some comments as I'm reading. And if you have any questions after, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, there is a curator character and she comes in and I will, I'll just tell you when that's happening. Um, and there's also notes throughout and, and visual art. So um, sometimes I wish I'd figured out a way to show the images while I'm reading but it's kind of, you know, I'd have to project them and 
it might be distracting, but anyway, but that's that's how it's laid out. Uh, I wanted it to feel like a, an exhibit catalog. Um, and my husband and I are visual artists. We look at, we read exhibit catalogs all the time, and they're really uh, getting better and better. <coughs> and I feel like that's that's a a form to be explored for sure. Uh, I'm a Goddard alum, and uh, somebody that I worked with there wrote the, the introduction, Jill Maggie, and um, she offers say this. She writes, Joy exclaims the flying Tristia Vogel of Kathleen Carr's Miraculum Monstrum, who is an artist living at the beginning of a world without oxygen and who grows wings. And the confusion of who in the grammar I chose is indicative of the book's fiction biography, autobiography, the joy of flight in the actions of the protagonist, and in this book's soaring genre abandon is possible despite an overwhelmingly inhospitable context. I almost wrote in hospital context, which is one of this book's truths. Institutions rarely serve the ones who are meant to fly. Yet it is inevitable that some should sprout wings. If it chooses you, I think the book argues, you are called on to be susceptible. So be susceptible. <laughs> um, Miraculum, a wonderful thing, prodigy, a miracle, monstrum, a significant, a significant supernatural event, a wonder, portent, alternatively a monster. Words are artifacts, relics, symbols. In spring, a rabbit opened by a crow. Dark-edged fear writes the rabbit death. It happens in the spring. Lilac-scented air in the park turns pages of her book as she eats her lunch, little wings in bright sun. An April afternoon lies on the grass, not hearing the murder of crows' shrill gape. The leaves knife sharp against the sable trunks, high pressure finite lines written across a landscape. She hears a bird serenade, tiny hammers on bells. Airborne notes punctuating vestiges of clouds, now thinned to gray scraps. Her back itches. Curator. This all happened before I was born. I imagine her as she might have been, before her transformation, before the annals of Miraculum Monstrum. The lost years when she was presumably living as any human woman would. There was breathable air then. This was before the atmospheric catastrophe, before the birds died, before the winds and earthquakes, when there was waste and leisure, whole days of temperate radiation. In retrospect, her mutation was prophesied, as many things in, are reckoned in hindsight, her temples hewn and texts produced. Contrary to natural law, she was born out of herself in the April month, already fused to a mythology that had yet to be created. Anomaly, the persistence of peripheral vision. I imagine her in time, in the weave of every moment, regardless of fact or record. On April 25th, she wakes up with a single hair thick as a bristle growing out of her left scapula. With a hand mirror, she examines over her shoulder. The sinister, portentous vine looks like a wire. She can't pull it out. It seems to be fused to the bone under the skin it erupts from. Is a dream the real world? This hair, a blackened bone being born. Beneath her skin, she feels herself leaning toward flight patterns of bird cloud lifting off a tree to the east of where she sits. She isn't aware of implications 
a small irritation on the west side of her back, a black hair. Walking home from the park, her sense is heightened, she feels like running. Breathing hard, though walking, walking at a tilt, vertiginous sidewalks in motion. The sensation on her back, several more wiry black hairs and bony protrusions on shoulder blade. Makes an appointment to see her doctor. Sarcoma could be Ewing sarcoma, blood sample, white paper, pale cheek to vinyl stretcher. Nude from waist up, on your stomach please. Abnormalities in chromosomes. Ewing is notably, fa notably found in the bone shaft, rare. Inside her chest, the ribs rest over a peritoneal sac, housing heart, lungs. Once, she saw a bird heart still beating in a ribboned carcass. The bird had been struck, turned in ragged cartwheels, glanced off a car. The body curled like a continuous apple peel. She walked from her porch where she had been sitting to look at the moist shards of gelatinous red, wanted to put her finger in the chest to touch the velvety blood charged with ebbing life. Thrashing pulse, flailing wing. She can't be dying. On your stomach, please. Is there pain? Yes. Vivis sectio. A live cutting, migration and song phenomena to be dissected. X-ray shows there is a consistency with perhaps fibrous dysplasia. Origins are mysterious. Monostatic in one bone, left scapula. Spinal bone cysts seem unrelated, inconsistent with fibrous dysplasia. The X-ray shows pitting in the bone Tumor-like growths consistent with dysplasia. Medullary bone becomes fibrous tissue. There are growths non-consistent, benign, let's hope. The x-ray, the beating heart, caged, this part looks like a feather shaft. We're not sure what this means. Your temperature is running below nor normal. Is that part of dysplasia? No, unrelated. Do you feel cold? No. On this night, she dreams of a dead pond. Frogs belly up, but the storks aren't feeding. It rains an oily spatter. Starling wings speckled the black, runs down her glass porch door. She looks closer, bird after bird, pounding soft bodies into the glass. Stunned, they recover vertical poise and launch into the door again, again. <clears throat> a pile grows. She thinks she will vomit. Her mouth opens. She almost breaks from the dream here. Feels, sees a bird beak writhing in her throat, rising from her throat hole, pushing along the esophageal passage, trying to be born, trying to escape, trying to herald. It is shrieking, then begins to wail, an infant. In the dream, her bile rises, propels the bird out, leaving her flaccid, the bones of her crushed, liquefied, or molten. She wakes, vomiting, shoulder throbbing, sarcoma. The moon lights translucent snakes in her vomit like tapeworms, maybe string or hair. She takes the bus to the emergency room. It is 2 a.m. Medical form, I can't read this, control number, district, am I dying, worker, phone, you are upset, please come, number, date, client ID, this information provided, temperature dropping, on this form may be used to determine eligibility, pressure on chest for federal, and we want you to speak to state programs using dead birds, social security, disability criteria, one, patient information, how long have you been, I am not, address, Phone, date of birth, physicians, there is a research lab, name, address, phone, specialty, dates of exam, first visit, last, will not live in a cage, visit, presenting symptoms, height, weight, blood pressure, muscle strength, 15 to 55, 2, diagnosis, you must attach, HIV infection, diagnostic, made comfortable, test, 
performed, attached, they look like feathers. Can you explain results, psychiatric evaluations, psychological evaluations, treatment and response, tests inconclusive. Please include past treatments. We need more tests and response. Be advised. This is blurry. Please sign here. We want to help. Horrendo rustica. Swallow, swallow, bloody bird. Turns milk to blood, flying under the herd. Flying over your house, your death he portends. If he lands on your shoulder, your life will end. This is a reading from the letter from Tara from Miraculum Monstrum, verse 8, chapter, tw chapter 8, verse 21. As Tristia and the broken women walked the path to the walled city, the Christians followed, and one of them shouted behind, these women are the slaves of contrivances. See the monster they follow, and the demon seed still swimming in its eyes. Tristia told her apostate tra Tara this annoying harassment should stop. And so they turned to the faithful and spat oil onto their skin. They ran away in fear, but continued to throw rocks from a distance. When they reached the city, Tristia spoke through Terra. The wall they've constructed won't keep the water out, so find higher ground. The water will wash the cities away. In the caves, we will breed new life. This is the word. This is fragmentary because there's um, the scripture is from the text of Miraculum Monstrum, um, which is it's a religious text based around the prophecy that this bird woman is going to come. Just so you know. They superimpose the stature of a god over her. Morphine drip. Gurney, the beige walls streaked with death stench. Bony eruptions metastasize, shifting tectonic plates, margins, testing, brush strokes, line, tone, linseed, testing her blood, plastic, planet, her saliva, marrow, feathers, secretions, probing her body, lungs, vines, liver, pancreas with instruments, dermis, marrow, plasma, vial, basin, cramps, vomiting, fever biopsy, shoulder, strata, ultrasound, x-ray, Magnetic resonance imagery, dissecting specialists, surgeons, photographs, documents, burning, leaking, discharge, sedation. But the miraculous feathers leak out. People come to see. Tests mutate to experiment. Papers are published. The published papers metastasize a kind of greed. A tracking device under left wing. Disruptive, they move her to a locked room with one small window to make her comfortable. Her intolerable bird, she was stainless in herself, wished everything away like space. She could grow afar of purity, fly out again, young and included to somewhere. In Paracula Vectus, she will fly. Leather straps against her arms, uncoiled feathers sprung from the bone meat. This feather of undaunted blood water arches. She sees in the dark the morphine drip. The songbirds whose songs are stolen for research, migratory Migratory birds who are funneled and disoriented, disoriented, where's their gyroscope? Arthur Cleveland, RNA, employed a county general for six years, employment terminated on X, incident involving a patient X, released without discharge, patient terminally ill, on morphine drip, hospice, assassination, patient released from locked ward by Mr. Cleveland on X. He informed staff that patient was uncomfortable and unnecessarily restrained and sedated. 
Patient in advanced stage of bone disease, unknown origin. Mr. Cleveland claimed patient was a mystic, induced his cooperation. Termination enacted, psychiatric evaluation recommended. Up on the roof, up on the hospital roof, shaking the morphine off, Tristius arms are lead sticks covered with bone spurs. Dying, she thinks. Last she knew. There is one arm mostly gone. Weight loss. She feels fine. Hungry. My body in revolt, she thinks. These look like wings, not tumors. Bone disease. She runs the roof, like an infant tied to a kite. Hands intact, wearing a ragged snap gown, she rears her wings and dives. Like painting the next stroke, there, like a net, a brace, every feather moves. She is tired, lands too quick, bloody knees, laughs. Where do I go now? She knows where it lies by air. I'm just going to read a little about what she looks like. She's meeting somebody who's going to help her and flies into her house. Obviously, scares the shit out of her. <laughs> the beauty of her ivory underfeather, cloaked with black, slick like tar. Tara tries to hit the bird thing, throws a plate, her boot, pulls a lamp from the socket and smashes, points the jagged end at the howling figure, crouching, makes her weep. Tara sits on the floor, cradling glass, closes her eyes, the adrenaline disrupting her high. What the fuck? Listens while it speaks. Transfixed. Can't move. Curator. I'm often asked how long it took for the wing growth transition to reach completion. How long did she lie drugged in the hospital? This would seem to be a simple matter of record, except many of the records were destroyed. We don't know why. We do know her cottage was emptied out and her things forwarded to her aunt, Percy Vogel. Her relative was then informed that Tristy had volunteered for a long-term research project, which her aunt disbelieved. Later, she was told Tristy had fallen from the roof of the hospital. From a complete inquiry into all existing records, my estimation is that it took six months for her wings to grow in and become usable. As soon as she realized she had wings, she escaped though they attempted to find her through a previously implanted tracking device. This was apparently destroyed or surgically removed. Tristia nervous motion head jerks to trailing edge of wing after attempts at recapture. Gaunt, covered with fine, definitive down. Contour feathers lay flat and gray on her chest and belly. The fur swells on her breast, nipples darkened, flinty, her calves in atrophy. She hunkers into a squat. The, pum the plumula on her back blanket with the network of stars where each primary feather tore through her skin. There is bat-like bone, fingers growing alula into the wing bend, sharp unwieldy aftershaft, semi-plumes. Under skin ribbon with feather picks, the glowing red pill sends out real-time signal to data logging medics. The mechanized body, a traitor of flesh, Machine propagandizes animal. She flies to the roof, dives to the top of the tree, glides, then back down, swimmy. Wants to carry Tara on her back, just to the top of the garage. No way. Tara laughs. She watches there. One more plunge, leap, shiver, run, frowl, this joy. Fluff pants as she winds down. 
Later she'll need meds. Tristy is pain, white needles stitch in her bones, singe fire, rip and bind. The violent flesh tip heals and quill. Nail heads back in barbwise, welt her sores. She dreams in a restless opiate fume, women who will come for talons. She dreams also of a half faced man. Where word reaches, masses come to witness the bird woman. First the bridge, revival-like, then meetings revolve. Graffiti house squatters, vacant lots, dirt cellars, writhing the abscess armed desperata. Internet code forwards the flock. The nascent legendary attracts another kind of follower. The Raptists began writing of a bird woman messiah in their scriptural text, Miraculum Monstrum, during the latter years of the 20th century. There is great rejoicing at the news of Tristia. They send Dr. Kure to bring her home. So I'm going to stop there and encourage you to read on. But there's one quote from Ann Waldman, which I really love, from Manatee Humanity. as things really heat up in the environmental crisis. That's what they'll say about us generations hence. How living then hence without so many animals then. They fucked the world over in their sweet, avaricious time frame. That's what they'll say about us, those stupid fuckers. They let the animals die. They let the plants die. They killed the air. They killed the water. They killed each other. They killed language. Thank you. I'm happy to answer questions uh, or to try to explain anything that is confusing. What was your impetus for writing this? <coughs> sort of starting down that path. Yeah, well, there were a couple of things, really. Um, I'm, as a writer, interested in hybridity, and um, I work in a lot of different forms. And I'm also a visual artist, so I thought, I wanted to make a work that sort of included all of that. And um, also, my mother was dying of early onset Alzheimer's at the time. And so the, her transitions were sort of inspiring to me as well. Um, and sort of the kind of research that I was doing for her condition uh, sort of ran alongside the research I did for different bone diseases and, you know, what it might actually look like if somebody were to grow wings. Because they wouldn't just appear. They would, something would happen. It would be, you know, it would be crazy, you know, and shocking, scary. So I wanted to build that out. Hmm. Yes. Um, so looking at this work, um, I'm interested in like any parts of the book that already existed as like these different little projects. Like, did you have a bunch of illustrations that you wanted that you knew were going to go somewhere, or did you start with the like letters themselves? Uh, mm. I'm interested in the process. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I was working on them sort of alongside. And some of them, I didn't really know where the things were going to go at all. I was just making a lot of bird-related work, which if you see you know, if you go to my website, it's pretty much all abstraction. So it was, you know, so like the, the swallow, I probably painted that first and then wrote the Hirondo Rustica part. But it's, and some of the, some of the work was already done and just lying around, you know, so, um, so it kind of evolved. They grew together, I'd say. 
But then, of course, the idea of putting something in a catalog for an exhibit was very appealing, like that. Um, the way when you're looking at a catalog, there's, you know, there's other people's work, and there's, then there's the artist's work, or there's are things that they were never, that were never meant to see, you know, there on the, like, here's some junk from so-and-so's studio, you know what I mean? So I wanted it to be a, a real container for that. Did you do an outline of the book first, or did it just kind of flow together? No. I've never written an outline in my life. <laughs> and if I did, probably wouldn't. I mean, some people do that, and I can see the, the value of it. But I kind of sort of knew what was going to happen, yeah. you know? I mean, I just didn't know how uh, A to B was going to go. But I was, um, definitely grew sort of around the story that was evolving. You know, it's sort of, writing is, is a lot like painting in that you, you write something and then you think about it and respond to it. You know, it's kind of a, I wish I could just sit down and work off an, uh, an outline. It would probably make things a lot easier, you know, in some ways. But of course, as a as a writer, artist, you're always you can always change your thing. Mm -hmm. So it's really just a game. Like, okay, I have this outline. I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about your writing process or rituals? Did you write in the morning? Did you write it in one big block? How long did it take you to write it? Oh, I worked I worked on it for a year and a half. And um, pretty steadily, I'd say I worked on it every day. I mean, as an artist, I work on something every day. Um, you know, I've really been doing more visual art lately because I just had a show. But then, you know, I always feel like whatever I'm not doing very in a very concentrated way becomes um, the escape from the work. You know, so I feel like I always have some, like, I'm going to go pro pro procrastinate and go make some prints now, <laughs> you know, but I'm still working. So it's, uh, um, yeah, I feel like that's, that's sort of, it took a while. And the, and the ending was, uh, we were just talking about this the other day. My mother had died and I had sold our houses and... The, the people who bought them allowed us to stay while we were cleaning out. Mm -hmm. It was her house, my house, and this barn that had like a hundred years of stuff in it. And so while we were staying there in this plasticed off room, they were ripping the house to shreds that I lovingly rebuilt myself, you know. And so at the end of the day, after we'd like, we'd drag things to the dumpster and like, horrifying snowed every day so we're dragging things my mother's house was up on this hill and there's a picture of it in here actually in the very beginning as Tristia's cottage yeah it's Sears house and so yeah Sears Roebuck house and so it was up on this hill and there was all the snow and it was just so at the end of the day we'd be totally exhausted and emotionally drained and it was like throwing away all my stuff from my entire life and in these dumpsters that were covered with snow. <laughs> and I'd sit down to write. <laughs> so I was probably in a sort of a morbid state of mind by then. Mm -hmm. But yeah. What does your editing process look like? Hmm? Your editing process, what does it look like? Oh, um, I'm fairly rigorous, um, but I allow myself to just write whatever at first, and then um, and then I'll go back at it later as sort of another person. Mm -hmm. So otherwise, I could never write anything. I'd just be like, "Oh, that word, no! <laughs> oh my God!" I mean, I can't imagine having to do that kind of thing all at once, like the editing and the creative process. You probably know what I, I'm talking about. Yes. You know, there's this dreadful editor who's like, you know, you have to shut it's it like off. Yeah. yeah. Do 
Do you have extra visuals and stuff that you created during the work on this that you are now sort of have to sort of figure out, whoa, what is this and what will it, what will it go with later? Or do you, have you shown other work in a different context? Uh, I well, I have I have tons of stuff. I'm in fact sort of um, hilarious that I have most of the pieces in here still. But I mean, I've sold a lot of work subsequently, but never really, um, you know. So I I kind of like to have a show sometime in conjunction with the book. That would be fun. Yeah, because I could definitely but, see that happen. Yeah. So there's always things that. I mean, I'm making things, and I think, well, could this be part of another book, or, a, you know, I'm because I'm I'm writing things, but I haven't really I haven't even figured out if if there will be visuals or how they will be, but I feel like that's sort of something that uh, comes together in a kind of a magical, you know, way that I don't need to know right. now, but. It will sort of, it'll occur, you know, if it's supposed to. But I didn't want the the art in here to feel illustrative. Yeah. Although sometimes it, it might be slightly illustrative of what's going on in that section. Yeah. Does the theme of transformation is, you know, widely through the did you think uh, of any of your other texts? Like I'm thinking of the metamorphosis by the even the tale of Swan Lake. Is there any intertextuality? Mm -hmm. Is there any intertextuality? Were you thinking of how your book fits within the realm of the theme? Oh. Yes. I mean, there's certainly a lot of literature to consider that, that sort of makes use of that sort of hybridity, right? Is that what you... Yeah, I can. Um, so, and, and my idols do it really well, like Banu Kapil and um, Anne Waldman is a great hybrid writer, and um, I mean, there's, there's a lot. Jill Maggie, for that matter, who wrote the introduction, and... Um, You know, there's there's a lot of there's a lot more artists that are writing and using that form, which is really nice. Um, but at the same time, I didn't, I haven't really seen too many fictional uh, art art catalogs like monographs. So I was I was kind of like, is anybody else doing that? <laughs> no. Um, and so maybe that will. You know, uh, who's Kamiko Han? She's sort of uh, a writer who's very um, conscious of inventing forms. You know, sort of based on Japanese, uh, ancient Japanese forms. And um, and she bought my book at AWP. I was <laughs> cool. so excited. And she's like, "Can you sign this for me?" It's like the weirdest <laughs> thing. Like, oh my God, no. Yeah. <laughs> you, you sign my hand. Or something, you know? But um, so there's, I, you know, being aware of it is hard, you know, when you're writing something to be aware of other work that's come before and want to be separate from that, and yet you're, you're, you can't help sort of being influenced by everything that you consume, you know. So, but of course you can't worry about that. You just have to do your thing, you know, and it's. Leave that to the rest of us to do. Yeah. Because <laughs> we, because it's you know, like the human nature of wanting to define those connections and patterns. Yeah, and it is the nature of the bookstore to want to define what you've written. So right. it's sort of yeah. like I, you do like need this. to have a shelf at the end of the right. day. Like, where are you gonna, you know? Like we were just talking about this. Yeah. Right. It was. Uh, I went to a bookstore and it was under essays, and I was like, well, you know, that's essays. not really right. <laughs> but. It was, you know, but I hope it could be under science fiction or fantasy or poems or, you know, maybe just by itself or yeah. <laughs> in a sort of a glass case with a light on it. <laughs> <laughs> be okay too. 
But yeah, you know, that's one of the pratfalls of hybrid literature. And if anybody, is anybody writing sort of looking at hybridity? And yeah, it's kind of like, you know, it, it makes it, it's a hard sell, you know? Um, the publisher I worked with, they've been really, really great, and they've been so supportive, but uh, Kate Gale said, maybe you want to write a novel. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, yeah, that would be really great. I'd like to write a romance novel, like a set of them, you know, so that I could then write my weird thing over here, but, you know. <laughs> but I don't know if that's actually possible. You know, you do have to, like Kerouac says, what you feel will find its own form. So, so you're kind of stuck with yourself at the end of the day. Although romance novels, like detective novels, I think about <laughs> it sometimes. I think, could I? Should I? Would I? I think about the same thing. The crime novels sometimes really yeah, sell. I like really crime. I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not sure. I could really do it, play it straight. You know, it would be like but the hybrid form is really growing. Um, yeah. Do you know Lydia Yuknovich, the author? She's an amazing author. Yeah. So she just had a little thread on her Facebook page the other day about, tell me about, I'm making a big giant list in a group. She's compiling like a, a resource for her students of hybrid publishers mm -hmm. and, and hybrid books. And I was like, oh, I know some. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mentioned Kathleen and even like, and Red Hen, I think, is, is doing a great job of publishing um, a lot of hybrid. They have, there's a book of lyrical essays, you know, Chelsea, when I met her at the table with you yeah. that time. Yeah. You know, they're just, they are, they're different, and I think publishers are more apt to, to jump on that now. It's kind of like a growing thing, so, you know, yeah, yeah. You, just, you write what you write, and then, yeah, you hope the bookstore is going to shelf it, right? But it's, well, somewhere we'll find it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. this is the kind of store where we would put it. I, I do the science fiction book club, mm -hmm. so when I sent out the newsletter, I said, hey, this is getting read. You know, yeah. how could you not put that under science fiction? But I also do poetry, and I was like, oh, you know, yeah. you could be in both places. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to see it, you know, growing, because I, I mean, this, I wrote this, you know, almost. You know, it's getting on 10 years ago now. You know, it took a while to write it, and then it took four years to submit it to places. And all that time, every time I got rejected, I thought, should I take the images out, or should I change this, or... Nah, I'm just gonna keep sending it out. And you know, I, um, I was sending it to both, you know, contests, and also just calls, and, you know, writing queries, and. But I got this letter from a room of her own that said, have you given up on your manuscript? <laughs> I said, yeah, actually, I have one of those. Because <laughs> it was so, it felt like a long time. And then it was two more years before it came out. So, I mean, it's, you know, you have to be persistent. Mm -hmm. Especially if, and you have to believe in your thing, you know. I mean, it's so easy to go, ugh, maybe it's not. <laughs> Some writing teacher I, I had told me she had sent out stories 30 times. And I was like, oh, wow. Oh, I, like, <laughs> yeah. I thought four was a lot. <laughs> 30. OK. Yeah. You know, so persistence. Yeah. Also, Red Hand Press let you, respected the way you constructed it. With yeah, the they, they kept my the original right manuscript, right. But, uh, the way it was laid out. They really didn't change. Hardly anything. They changed the fonts a little bit. But, That's huge. So, to but, make the song feel like they did something. Yeah. Um, do you also uh, teach? Teach? Yeah, I do. Um, I'd like to teach writing more, but I actually have um, my graduate degrees in visual art, mm -hmm. so I end up teaching um, that more. But. Um, but I'm trying. I keep like, you know, I'll run the class and it's really weird, no one will sign up and you know, that that's been happening. Come to VCFA, we're hungry. Yeah. yeah, no, I um I'd just love to get an actual job. <laughs> that would be great. Because, <laughs> you know, you just have to do whatever to pay the rent. So teaching would be great, but you know, I also make beds and clean houses and 
teach at our crazy school that we're teaching at. The crazy school. So, yeah. Well, I know a couple of students up there that would benefit from your wisdom and the specific style that you've written it. So. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, just tell tell your tell the faculty <laughs> that I'll be right over it. No, I'll be right over it. Just up. It is. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I looked at I looked at that school actually, um, but we ended up going to Goddard. So yeah. So any any other anybody? Well, thank you so much. It's been so fun. Thank you. Thank you.